I have attended this conference for the past five or six years, and I have always enjoyed talking with regulators, community bankers, and academics. And the value in that conversation is not only awareness, but a path for improvement through future research and further dialogue. I am extremely excited to be a part of today's discussion with the panel. Up to this point in the conference, you have heard discussions from research papers, you have heard the national survey results, and you've even heard from the 2020 CSBS case study winning team from my alma mater, Mississippi State University. <laughs> the conversation we hope to have in this segment is less numerical, it will be less research oriented, but no less important to the topic of community banking, both the business model and community engagement. We're fortunate today to have two community bankers and a community leader on the panel. Their backgrounds adds a unique perspective to the conversation of the issues impacting not only community banking, but the communities they serve. I will not read the bios in their entirety, but I will give a general overview of their experiences and their um, background. The conference material will have the full bios. Our first panelist is Frank Scott, Jr., Mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas. Mayor Scott was elected mayor of Arkansas's capital and most populated city in December of 2018. While Mayor Scott serves as a chief executive for the city of Little Rock, he is also a former community banker. It is in this position that he learned of the many issues impacting small businesses across his city. Our next panelist is Jill Castilla. Jill is the president, CEO, and vice chairman of Citizens Bank of Edmond, Edmond, Oklahoma. Jill serves as the civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army and is on the American Bankers Association board. She is also a member of the Federal Reserve Bank's Kansas City Community Depository Institutions Advisory Council. A third panelist is Kenneth Kelly. Kenneth is the chairman and CEO of First Independence Bank, a minority depository institution located in Detroit, Michigan. Kenneth serves as chairman of the National Bankers Association, and he was named as the Federal Reserve Bank's 7th District Community Depository Institutions Advisory Council in 2018. Welcome panelists and thank you for being a part of today's discussion. For the audience, we're going to have some planned discussion around a few topics and we're going to open to the audience for more participation at the end of the segment. The first topic that we want to talk about has been a part of our daily lives for the past seven months and a part of our current virtual reality the pandemic. I know for me, I had to essentially rewrite our agency's playbook when it came to what do we do in response to the pandemic. Solutions that worked during past disruptions did not necessarily work in a pandemic scenario. I also realized that leading an agency or an institution or a community during this type of crisis was not only character defining, but industry defining. So I'm interested to hear from the panelists today on how they met the needs of their communities during this health crisis, and really if the response was in fact industry defining. So Mayor Scott, I would like to start and pose this question first to you. As a community leader, you had a broader stroke of responsibility when it came to your response to the pandemic. What, what, what experience can you share with the group? Uh, well, first and foremost, just thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, being a former banker myself, uh, to be a part of this conference, uh, it's just uh, always a pleasure to, to be back in the house with fellow bankers and those uh, uh, what I would call true economic developers. Uh, as it relates to uh, COVID-19, I can tell you one thing. Uh, there's no mayor uh, in America that could have predicted uh, that we not only would experience a global pandemic in our lifetime, um, our generation's social and civil unrest that we're experiencing right now, and quite frankly, economic recession. Uh, but in spite of it all, we all signed up for it. Uh, we signed up to lead, we signed up to serve. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is to ensure that we keep our residents first in all things that we do. We all took an oath for our public safety, health, and welfare of our cities. 
And so when you take that type of oath, you have to take it seriously. And so what we wanted to focus on was to be early and aggressive in protecting and advancing our residents throughout this COVID-19. So we started off with a number of different measures, protective measures, whether it was uh, sometimes inconvenient, oftentimes uh, not necessarily the liking of, of other folks, but we had to be aggressive to get us through uh, what we've now seen over the past six months. So whether it was uh, transitioning our restaurant owners to uh, curbside online de delivery service, uh, to mask mandates, to uh, if you had a commerce restriction within your particular city, having early curfews to really uh, slow down the community spread to ensure that we did have uh, the best footing and fa foundational footing to have uh, economic recovery, which we're all trying to do right now is to have restoration. And so those are some of the things as a community leader is being early and aggressive, uh, but also most importantly, communicating to your residents the why for decisions and giving a path forward to create some consistency uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Mayor Scott. Um, Kenneth, I want to ask you the same question from your community bank perspective. Christiana, thanks for having us and thanks for the question. Glad to be on the panel with the mayor and Jill. Um, as you think about COVID-19, we had really two issues to deal with, very much like what the mayor just described. One was a life issue, and then one was a livelihood issue. The life issue created a very unique opportunity for us because there was fear. People didn't understand what was going on with COVID-19. Should we come to work? We were identified by the Secretary of Treasury as um, uh, necessary um, facilities, and so we had to go to work every day and take care of our customers and take care of the city and keep as much of the economy going as possible. And so that fear we had to deal with was just the reality. And the way we dealt with that was to communicate more often. So we had more of uh, team meetings on a daily basis to kind of talk about what was going on. How do we deal with the cleaning and supplies just from a, again, dealing with the fear of not knowing what COVID-19 was and around us. And in Detroit, you saw we were pretty much at the top of the list of the new cities around the country at that point in time. So that was item one. Item two was really dealing with the livelihood issue. You know, people were concerned, am I going to be laid off? Um, what's going to happen with my family from a financial perspective? Well, we did our best to try to manage through that for a period of time. But the reality is we moved right into trying to fly the airplane down the runway and build it in dealing with PPP which was a stimulus package. And that was a very new, very trying opportunity for us. But for small banks like ours in the community banking sector, we were able to align with many of the larger banks when we weren't sure we were going to be able to get into the Federal Reserve facility and participate in the PPPL facility. But all of that worked itself out. And so we actually ended up doing a little bit of both. So from my perspective as a national bankers chair, we saw this happening across minority banks across the country. And that communications level, again, proved to be key to allow us to move effectively. So I'll end by sharing there and hopefully hear from Jill and what she had to experience in that process. But thank you. And Jill, you included a little bit of your pandemic response in your bio. Can you share some of that with us too? I'm um, sure. Gosh, there's you know so much great leadership from these two gentlemen, and we try to do the same thing. Um, you know, making sure that we are providing a healthy banking environment, just from a, a health standpoint, but also an economic. We had a rally cry with our team that we were going to serve as economic first responders through this crisis, knowing that our medical personnel were being called to action, and we we knew that as community bankers that that was our role as well. Um, so our team, um, as um, the crisis evolved, um, just to, we had whiteboards everywhere throughout the bank and um, brainstorming on how we could help um, our customers in our community and our team members as we evolved through this crisis. And the first thing we did um, whenever the um, we were forming the CARES Act, we were highly engaged with our customers, called every single business customer we have, um, mail letters to all of our consumer customers, um, assessed um, credit, um, what their credit situation was, whether they needed access to some liquidity, some modifications in their loans so that we could uh, make sure their cash flow stayed intact. And um, with that, we really were able to gain a lot of great information that we could convey to DC and to our regulators as they were forming, forming the relief, um, uh, what ultimately became 
the CARES Act and PPP. Um, we went right into action with PPP working 24 seven, our 55 team members really all, it was all hands on deck working through that. But the stimulus checks, it's gonna take a couple of weeks to get stimulus checks out. We were already being very, um, waiving all of our overdraft fees and being very liberal in our overdraft policies and ended up partnering with Mark Cuban um, to develop more of a defined way in which other banks replicate to be able to get those funds um, to Americans um, while they waited for those checks. Um, that ultimately led to PDP and, as I said, uh, the whole staff being engaged. And at the same time, we were seeing that a lot of the urban areas throughout the country, um, the small businesses, particularly those owned by minorities, did not have the same access and relationship with banks that were offering PPP. They did, just didn't have access. The fintechs really didn't have the funding underneath them yet to be able to serve those communities. So I um, served as a matchmaker for thousands of small businesses throughout the country, finding community banks that could serve them to help them get access to PPP funds. Through that, uh, Mark Cuban uh, was also sending me his small businesses that were reaching out to him. And then I got an email saying, we need help uh, when the PPP forgiveness application came out. And it was so um, cumbersome, even more difficult than the PPP application that we had to do something. So that's where we were able to partner and actually pull from an experience we had a little rock um, through the think tech um, uh, FinTech Accelerator that's there uh, with a company, Tesla, an Arkansas company, who we partnered together and developed PPP.Bank, uh, which guides small businesses through the forgiveness application with PPP. Um, without collecting any data from them, no economic benefit to any of us, just really trying to serve our country well. Um, and that also led us to modify how we were um, engaging with our customers, ensuring as much accessibility and knowing that accessibility and communication is so important in a crisis. So we we started offering curbside banking services, kind of chick fil a um, the drive through experience. So, um, and we think that that's something that will likely stick as um, we come out of this pandemic into the new normal. We also filed a, pan a patent in February and able to launch a small business kind of micro banks where they could go in and do large cash transactions, change orders, get access to real coin without having to interact with anyone in the bank. They could open uh, the bank basically with their cell phone and then be able to conduct large, tra larger cash transactions and still having access to that much needed cash even though the lobby was closed. Thank you. Um, this conversation actually segues really nicely into my next question. The, the pandemic required us to, to think outside the box. It, in the conversation that I have with my bankers, technology is the common thread. Technology was used for continuity of operations. One of my bankers, um, she referred to her escalation of her technology plan as being catapulted into a virtual reality. And I laugh because I think we all felt that way at some point in time immediately after the pandemic. And so my next question is posed to you, Jill. How has the deployment of your technology changed expectations of your customers, of your employees? And, and, and really, how has this health emergency changed the strategic vision of your bank? I know you mentioned the curbside service just, just now. What are your other um, sustainable changes that you foresee down the road? And what we've seen, and I think that all my peers saw this as well, this massive migration, especially for non-tech savvy older um, customers to digital um, services. And so um, we found that our phone interaction um, went through the roof. You know, what was formerly a couple hundred calls a day turned easily turned into a thousand calls. And so we implemented a chat feature to kind of supplement um, some of those discussions. Um, I think what, where it really helped us is that we had a, a culture here where it was okay to fail as long as we were failing small and it wasn't risking any customer information or the financial viability of the bank that we could still take these small risks. And so to be able to implement a chat feature, for instance, that wasn't really um, a financial tool, but a way to, to, or to communicate with the customer well if they're doing a password reset or something, um, it, it was such a, it was just such a good um, experience to see that. And that chat feature was, it came from our retail department. One of our tellers said we should consider doing a chat on the website that might really help. And so I think it really activated everyone to know that we're all supposed to be the innovators, that we're all the entrepreneurs, and that we're all called to this action to help the customer. Um, there 
there were so many kind of bigger um, technology partnerships. Um, we I mentioned Tesla, who we partnered with with PPP.Bank, but they gave their technology out for free to community banks throughout the nation and, with, and allowed all of us to be able to handle PPP applications much more simply. And we saw other um, technology providers really step up, which for us, I think, um, changed the way I think we'll view fintech partnerships going, um, going into the future, not so much looking at the product, but looking at do we have a common purpose? Are we here to serve the customer in a way that um, elevates the experience in banking, accessibility, communication, um, and the ease and inter user interface so that it's not just geared to millennials, but really to all generations. I think that will change forever what community banking um, looks for in a in technology vendor. Um, there was just, a, there's a, I heard the term Corona Karma um, being used quite a bit in the early stages of the, of the virus that companies really were going to prove who they were through this pandemic. And um, I think we'll look back on this and want to continue to partner with those companies that really stepped up to serve the public um, during this time of crisis. Thanks, Jill. Ken, can you add another um, community banker aspect to that? It's the same, but I'll get into a little bit of details, and this is a, not quite a one-upper, but the reality is we saw a lot of billionaires get into this space. Robert Smith, who many know across the country and, and runs one of the largest VCs in technology in the country. I think they have about 60 um, companies of technology. He actually provided free software to the minority banks to really lean into the whole PPP process. And so we are seeing that same level of migration that you just heard Jill describe. And I think it is something that's going to be permanent. The reality is we're going to have to move further along in that process. Community banks, because of lack of resources, typically have not had the bench strength to move the, the, as fast technologically as they need to, but we're having to. For instance, one of the things we've done in the midst of coming out of this, we recently announced, I think it was in August with Google, we're one of, at that point in time, six banks that are going to be doing um, doing uh, Google Cash with Google moving forward. So we're going to have to figure out how to get into, as I call it, the logistics of moving money digitally. It's just a reality of where we are in the midst of having to close offices and close down um, and, and interact in a way that is conducive to what's going on with COVID, I think it's just expedited that whole process for us. So uh, we're hopeful, though, this future will be a bright future for community banks. There is no substitute for relationship hand-to-hand -hand comeback and knowing those customers on the ground, being able to reach out and maybe not touch them as easily, but at least be able to see them and what the products that they're doing. So we believe still there's going to be a place for community banks. It's just going to have to evolve in the digital world. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Scott, I'm, I'm going to take the question a little bit for you. We have a called the do list as mayor. How has this pandemic changed your thoughts on technology and that script? Well, uh, for everyone, what uh, Rashawn is speaking to is our transition report. Uh, it's the script that we're acting from each and every day from our policy agenda. Uh, and again, as I shared, there's no mayor in, in this, uh, these United States of America. Uh, we all had high hopes in 2020. Uh, we didn't expect to go through what we're currently going through right now. Just like every business owner, every community banker, uh, just any organization uh, had to look at and revise and pivot what their current plans were because we had to put our people first. Uh, as it relates to exp uh, experiencing this COVID-19 pandemic, we've started to say we've gotten used to being in crisis management uh, and no longer will we, will we be deterred uh, by COVID-19. Uh, so we're back at our script. Uh, we're going after as much as possible, clearly within the confines of our financial constraints that we now have. Uh, but we're not allowing the pandemic to stop us from our true mission and our internal why. And so we are excited that we recently announced uh, from a education perspective, uh, the city of Little Rock has historically not been involved in school district affairs. I think everyone here, particularly from a community banking standpoint, workforce education is, is vital and critical to the forward movement of any city and community and that you have a prosperous community. Uh, and ultimately, and so we recently announced our community schools model that focuses on um, 
wraparound services for our most at-risk students for our most at-risk schools in our local school district. Uh, so we recently announced that. We were excited to get that accomplished throughout this process. We also are recognizing that through COVID-19, as it gets back to what our, our two colleagues have just shared as it relates to technology, uh, we're in a new world now. Uh, myself being a millennial mayor, I'm used to technology, but we have to get all of our residents used to technology, and we have the opportunity to serve 2,500 employees with the city of Little Rock. And so now we're all now becoming more acquainted with remote work. And there's a new economy. Uh, we, we knew there was a tech economy, but so many businesses are um, erupting from this pandemic. Uh, and we're hoping to hone in on that to find new strategies as well. Hey, right. thank you. We have one more plan topic and I'm gonna move on to that. Um, this conversation in our next topic, some people call it a candid conversation. Some people refer to it as a courageous conversation. The topic of inclusion and diversity. Uh, more specifically, the importance of and the initiatives around inclusion and diversity. It has been a long conversation or topic in many communities across America. The social conflicts in our country over the last five months have elevated this conversation in many bank boardrooms, and frankly, it's led to almost a race towards the inclusion and diversity finish line for many large public companies. Talking about diversity and inclusion can be difficult, and I believe to have a productive conversation, there should be sufficient awareness around two things, deficiencies within our agency and our companies, and the potential barriers that contribute to minority disparities. And I'm using minorities rather broadly to capture racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in, in, in banking and in, in government sector. The characteristics of our panelists, they do lend to some element of inclusion, community banking, and in government. Um, but most of the value truly comes from the perspectives of the communities that we serve. Each of us on the panel, we have some state and city history of events that gives us context to this conversation. Mississippi, Arkansas, Michigan and Oklahoma. So Kenneth, I want to pose this question to you first. And, and I looked this morning, and I said, it's not a loaded question, is it? It might be a loaded question, but it's a fair question, I think. So I'm going to ask this question and you just let me know what your thoughts are. Absolutely. Um, okay. So my question is, how important is the topic around inclusion and diversity? Is this necessary? In other words, is having an intentional conversation around inclusion and diversity necessary to prompt research, um, encourage further conversation, and to affect change? And, and why is inclusion and diversity so important? Thank you for that question. The reality is this is one of those taboo topics that have kept us from progressing to where we should be. And unfortunately, let me just kind of go back. You've got to be rooted in historical context to really appreciate it. And I'll just start with my, our bank. Our bank actually was founded. It was founded as one of the positive outcomes of the 1967 riots. And so when you think about that, and we're celebrating exactly 50 years at 67, it took them two and a half years to get a charter. 50 years later, we're dealing with some of the same issues related to George Floyd, et cetera. And if you go back further in history, you'll see this kind of repeat itself. The reality is we are a summation of all of our experiences. And in the American experience, we've had some things that take place in our DNA that we don't want to talk about. But as we think about how do we make a difference in this, we've got to raise our hands, no difference in the recovery process for Alcoholic Anonymous and say, this is something we want to deal with. We have to be, as you just described the word, very intentional. Now, I will tell you, people who deal with this in a way that is um, forward moving, do it through authenticity. That is to understand themselves first and to understand how they play a part in that, whether it is subconscious or consciously. And until we recognize that we have to do that on self-awareness and self-discovery of how we either participate through omission or commission, we will not make any progress. So what you're seeing now in terms of the um, discussions across the country and even around the world with George Floyd is people can see what's happening right in front of them. And we've just got to take on the leadership and the ownership of some of these issues personally, within our families, within our communities, as a state and as a nation that we can do better. 
And what I would ask anyone to do is do the self-reflection first. How do you either contribute to it actively or passively through omission or commission first and be willing to have an authentic conversation? I have made myself available through publications inside of the state of Michigan. Also in the ABA Journal, we have a, a, an article that they just published talking about real authentic conversations. And so I would just ask this listening audience to open yourself to authentic conversations and be willing to do that to come from a place of vulnerability to learn and to grow through this process. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Scott, would you add something to that? Yes, uh, I think uh, during this time, um, if you go back through history, being a student of history, one being the mayor of Little Rock, uh, 63 years ago, um, on September 25th, uh, nine teenagers entered Little Rock Central High to uh, challenge Brown versus Board of Education uh, to integrate not only Little Rock Central High, but to start the integration process across the nation of these United States. And so when you understand that history, uh, that was one of the uh, of key uh, catalysts to the civil rights movement. Fast forward now to 2020, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, countless others, Jacob Blake, uh, represent what I would call our nation's Emmett Till moment, uh, many of which we've seen uh, individuals uh, die tragic deaths uh, through the Internet, via phone uh, of this nature. And so the business communities, the community bankers, one of the key questions as a mayor that we often get through in this process of the, what I would call a summer reckoning is what can we do to help? And then the pushback is always is we have to move from the statements. We have to move from the sponsorships. But as Brother Kelly has shared earlier, we have to be very intentional. And so some things that we've been sharing so far here in Little Rock is really to focus on three pillars, justice, equitable economics and the eradication of racism and particularly understand many people think when you think of just you think of something that is illegal no it means something that is right something that is right and just it could be educational justice it could be economic justice it could be health care justice one of the things that we've seen in COVID-19 is not only health care disparities within minorities but financial disparities because we understand as community bankers there's certain folks and certain businesses that may not have a banking relationship because they have been underbanked and unbanked. And there's a reason why they've been unbanked and underbanked because there's been a skills gap within the minority community. Hence the reason why when you think about equitable economics, we need more organizations focused on how do we close that skills gap by creating robust and comprehensive minority business development programs to help an existing business owner, an existing entrepreneur, not only have a business, but actually understand operational excellence and financial excellence within that business so they can move from that economic cycle of being unbanked and underbanked to being bankable. And so we have to have that focus of equitable economics from a community banking standpoint, because if we can do it from a community banking standpoint and grow our economy, economic development in addition to education is a true equalizer. Thank you for your passionate response. Um, Jill, would you um, share your thoughts? You know, you don't, I think this season and especially this past year has made me realize and so many of my friends that we need to do and be better and this intentionality and this theme of what all three of us are going to talk about, which I, I'm, there's just no way I can do it as eloquently as my two predecessors, but to intentionally be in those communities, to seek out relationships. I, my bank is sitting in an affluent suburb that has been historically what a white suburb would be defined as. And we, um, a couple of years ago, uh, were involved with some of the leadership in our city, um, not, not the elected leadership, but the leaders of our community that were um, the first sit-in um, during that kicked off the civil rights movement. Clara Looper uh, was here in Oklahoma City, but it was not something really celebrated in our communities. We were part of um, resurrecting and really highlighting that um, and reenacting that sit-in so that we could highlight 
highlight that important part of our history as a city, but also um, highlight that there's some parts of our city that haven't received the same uh, renaissance experience as the rest of Oklahoma City. And through that connection, we were able to um, really engage with community leadership and gain great friends that expose some um, development opportunities in Northeast Oklahoma City's particularly majority minority community that hadn't had a new um, development in over 45 years. And um, we had investors that had gone through 35 different banks um, who had denied them based upon not thinking that they could get comps in an area and came to us without us knowing that this history of denials to see if we would be interested in financing the deal. Um, it was going to provide a health um, care center, which there was a desert of community health care available in this particular area of the city. But then the development that this of this project was going to lead to a retail development across the street that was going to provide a lot of great opportunities for entrepreneurs to open new businesses and create more wealth in the community. Um, we, um, we, whenever we stepped out and did that development, it was everything was pre-leased. We had amazing guarantees. Um, the LTV was strong. I mean, all your principles of credit were there. It was just the location that was being avoided, which we know I mean, redlining is illegal, but it was the perception of value was keeping in the deployment of capital into an area. And so I think we have to be really careful that we don't, we, unconscious bias, you know, has so many different definitions. But even when you look at areas of a city and where you might be turned off to lending there, uh, you have to examine why. And, you know, are, if you really, if you're hitting all these fundamental principles of credit, you know, is there something else beyond that that's keeping me from going? And so it's really important to have, to question yourself, to, um, have friends uh, from all areas of the city of all kinds of backgrounds of all different experiences in life challenge your own um, perceptions and how you think the world is and um, and then start becoming an advocate step out and deploy the capital um, you know that's where as bankers we we're talking about the mayor was talking about the different roles that are in um, um, in correcting the situation or at least getting us to where we have some progress and that economic development is something that I can directly impact as bankers and community bankers we're so good at and so to be able to deploy the capital to find those developers we had a Northeast develop Northeast Oklahoma City Development Conference, and they the the organizers of that conference were concerned about attendance. Well, it sold out within minutes, and they had to have a subsequent conference because there was so much interest in the community and those that came from it to invest and develop it and create economic prosperity there that hadn't been experienced in the rest of the city. That was just extraordinary to see the active that how capital was being activated, ideas are being activated, and the engagement and in all different ways and of diverse individuals um, was happening just because we all came together. And so look for those opportunities. And it's certainly something that, again, I'm learning and growing and, and uh, love to connect um, even further with the other bankers that have those same experiences. So it feels like we've come full circle with these past two days. And so I'm going to just have one last takeaway question posed to the panelists. What is the biggest opportunity for community banks? And, and Mayor Scott, you as a former community banker, you can apply on this also. But so, so I'll begin with you, Mayor Scott. What do you think the biggest opportunity we have ahead for community banks? I think definitely the biggest opportunity is to invest in intentional efforts to close the skills gap that minorities uh, businesses may have uh, that are being unbanked and underbanked. Uh, to make investments by meeting uh, your customers and your prospective customers where they are, uh, literally moving uh, and being intentional about locating branches and a branch network within um, a low to moderate income um, areas, but not only having the branch net network, but really be very intentional about your lending in those areas with those businesses. And think of different ways of how you can invest in minority business development programs. So as the, as uh, minorities are moving up this cycle to become bankable and not only are becoming bankable, but become future customers of community banks to keep the community economic cycle uh, moving forward together. Thank you. Um, Jill, can you add to that? Yes, and I love the research. There was a couple of research papers that I thought were just extraordinary, and I know that there was some discussion about 
um, incorporating braids, but I also would encourage them to consider looking at urban areas versus rural areas because we get a lot of discussion about how important community banks are in rural areas, but our importance in, in urban areas shouldn't be underscored. And this interdependency of community banks and small businesses, there was that question whether you know one whether it was a chicken and the egg, but we really see them as being codependent. You know, they have to kind of exist together. And especially in minority communities, there's just such this great history of independent businesses that if you don't have the community bank there, they don't have the access to capital that you need. And then the um, inverse relationship and the size of bank to the um, to the access that low income individuals have to credit was also really interesting. The, low, the smaller the bank, the greater the access to credit. And to the mayor's point, getting to make sure that we're physically located, whether it's a bank, a LPO, a branch, or just being present in a community and providing that access, you see the importance there of just being present. Uh, I think the consistent thing for us has been just increased accessibility for us. The expectation from our customers is 24 seven. We are where you are, and there are no barriers to entry whenever you walk through our door that you want to do business with us. And so that accessibility question, I think, just has to continue to be answered to make it where it's just without uh, regard for where you are, who you are, that everyone has that equitable access, and there's just no perceived barriers. Thank you. Um, Kids, would you give us your final thoughts? Sure. I, I think it comes down to understanding history and context and then learning and asking the question of why. Why are things the way that they really are? A hey, for instance is the payday lending industry is a $44 billion industry. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Payday lending buildings on the same street as my bank branch, they look nicer than my bank branch. It means it tells you they're making more money than I am. And so you have to ask, ask yourself, why is that? And so the point I'm trying to make is, and I think both of my uh, panelists here with the mayor and Jill both stated it. We, we have to think through these as opportunities for income and growth. And so we've learned through just the three of us discussing a little bit of our own differences and where we're coming from. But the reality is there is a reason that you see these disparities in income in minority communities and household values are different because they're, first of all, probably earning a less or sa a salary. We know those statistics. They are there. We know that 70% of African Americans don't have a bank branch in their neighborhood. 70%. That's a Chicago uh, Fed study. The, the point is, there's the data there. So I challenge us to become steep in the data because then we can begin to ask the question of why, and then we can decide on policies that will make a difference in these. And so when you look at them, it's an opportunity for us to raise and, and raise the, the, the um, raise all boats. I use that metaphor. Uh, but the reality is we're not going to do it if we are, you know, too inward in terms of our thinking on this. That's someone else's problem. Um, the, the disparities that you see in police brutality, uh, those are somewhat economic. Those are economic issues. And we have to fight against those. We see that there's a correlation in police brutality directly related to economics in neighborhoods. That, that's just a reality. You don't see those same disparities in rich parts of town. Now, the reality is, yes, I get pulled over or anyone else will based on some of those other issues. But the point I'm trying to make is if we drive on some of these economic issues, whether you go back to slavery and go through Jim Crow days or now the civil rights era in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we found that at the core of all of those has been economic. So as bankers, it is our responsibility, I think, to have that historical context and begin to ask the question, why? And begin to fill that why with policies that make a difference. Thank you. Um, Jim, I think with, with one minute left, I can give some thanks and we'll, we'll, we'll resume to the um, post-plenary meetings after at four. Um, and so I do want to thank the um, Federal Reserve System, FTIC, and CSBS for giving us the opportunity to have this platform of conversation. And also thank our panelists, Jill, Frank, and Kenneth for their willingness to share their experiences and their initiatives on this front. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. <laughs>